Don't think of a big pink elephant. Whatever you do, don't think of a big pink elephant in front of this room. Somebody had decades of experience and they put it into a book and you can sit down and read that in a few days, download decades into days. Your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. What, what do you mean? You're like, you're 84, you have no problems. And she's like, no, I have puzzles. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you're struggling right now, it's because we've all had this 20th century education. In a 20th century education prepared us for a 20th century world, which at the turn of the century was working in farms and factories. And that's what a lot of the education system was, was, was tailored to, right? It's one size fits all, sit quietly, you know, by yourself, don't talk to your neighbor and so on. Now it's changed, it has changed, but the world's changed a lot faster. Is that fair? I get to do a lot of training for uh, SpaceX and I, I posted a picture recently you know, with Elon and everyone in the audience there. And I trained some of the most amazing brains, but like think about Elon, right? It's, he, in his world, we, we live in an age of electric cars and spaceships that are going to Mars. But our vehicle of choice that we choose when it comes to learning is like a horse and carriage. Do you feel that? Do you feel like you're falling behind more and more and more that you can't keep up? Like how do you get ahead in this world when you feel like you're falling behind? When you understand how your brain works, you could work your brain. And so the truth is every single one of you could do this. We just weren't taught how to do this, all right? If anything, we were taught a lie that somehow our intelligence, our potential, our memory is somehow fixed like our shoe size. But really what this is about, if the essence of what we're talking about here is about transcending, ending the trance. That's what transcendence is for me, ending this trance, ending this mass hypnosis that somehow you know, we're limited. Somehow, like something is fixed, right? That our powers are something, like we're not as strong and capable as we are, that we're not enough. So if I ask you to don't think of a big pink elephant, whatever you do, don't think of a big pink elephant in front of this room, pink polka dot elephant. What are you gonna do? You're gonna think about it because your mind can't process a negative. Your mind can't process a negative. That's why we always do affirmations in the positive. It's not something you don't want, it's something you want because your mind can't process a negative, right? Because it has to think about what you don't want to in order to be able to do it, right? And so what you resist persists. So don't try to think about, not think about everything going on, just write it down so you know it's there and then you can focus, right? The thing that you wanna forget are your limitations. Are we ready to cover that? Limiting beliefs, limiting beliefs. Because if you believe you can and believe you can't, either way you're right. Here's what you wanna remember. You know who has a really good memory? Elephants, right? What animal? Elephants. You ever notice the elephant, like the elephant at the circus and you wonder why it's tied to this rope to the stake in the ground and you wonder why it just doesn't like leave because it's an elephant right it is incredibly strong it's incredibly huge we could pull down the whole circus tent but why doesn't it because since that elephant's been born it's been tied to that same rope with the same stake in the ground and when it was first born it would try to get its freedom it wants its sovereignty right it would pull 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 and it would struggle for days maybe a week or so but after a week or so what happens it learns something it learns it's helpless. And in psychology, it's called learned helplessness because what happens over time? That elephant gets big and strong, right? And it's physically capable of escaping, but it's not mentally capable. Does that make sense? Because all behavior is belief driven. Think about like you believe what, how smart you are. Do people have a belief how much, how much they're worth financially? Yes or yes. They're gonna set that thermostat and the environment's gonna reflect. There's a success formula I subscribe to. I believe it's this. Be, do, have, share. In that sequence, because the syntax is very important here. Be, do, have, share. Now, it's kind of interesting because some people try to reverse engineer this or, or actually like put something that's later, something former, right? Like somebody could, uh, somebody, you've heard this before, right? Where somebody wins the lottery, all of a sudden they're at the have stage and they have millions of dollars. What happens after years? What happens to their, to their financial situation? Right, it's all gone, right? Because they, they, they were given or they have millions of dollars, but it, sorry, with the B, they were never a millionaire. Does that make sense? Right, so they never had to be able to do those things, so it went back to that thermostat. Does that make sense? Now, in order to be, do, have, share, in order to have anything to share with the world, you need to be able to do something. Is that true? Because right? it's not just the law of attraction, it's the law of action, right? You're taking action on things. And so in order to be able to do something, you need a belief that allows you to do that behavior, okay? So for example, if for somebody, let's say that they have trouble remembering names, if you have a belief, a sense of certainty around this idea that you're not good with names, what's gonna happen? 
You're not going to remember. I remember um, I was preparing to run a marathon and I was reading this book on training. And one of the chapters was on the psychology of running a marathon. It said this, your brain is a supercomputer and your self-talk is the program it will run. So if you tell yourself you're not good at remembering names, you will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. Does that make sense? Because here's the thing, a lot of times people will go and just say, they come to me and say, Jim, I'm too old, or this runs in my family, or I'm just not smart enough, or I have a horrible memory. But I always tell people, if you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, right? If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you argue for your limits, they're yours, right? And so you always wanted to monitor, you always wanted to monitor your self-talk. Always, always monitor your self-talk. Because here's why, your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. Here's the thing, you could go 25, 50% further in your health, in your relationships, right? In your, in your grades, right? But it's having that belief that says you can do it. Because here's what you always want to remember, all behavior is belief-driven. All behavior is belief-driven. In order to do a new behavior, you need an empowering belief that allows you to do those, that behavior. And so when we do this visualization exercise, it's not just limited to, to students, right? I do this with, with executives. I do this with athletes a lot. What did, um, I'll give you an example. What did Roger Bannister do in 1954? What is he famous for? The four minute mile, right? Throughout human history, nobody can run a mile in less than four minutes, right? And how is he able to do it? It wasn't just physical training, he would do mental training, right? He would visualize himself crossing the finish line, looking at the clock, and it said 359. Because he knows what you know, that success is an inside-out process. Here's the thing, it's not you'll believe it when you see it. It's you'll see it when you believe it. Does that make sense? You, you'll see yeah, you, When you actually see it, when you believe it in here, because all behavior is belief-driven. So he was able to do it because he saw 359 in his mind, then he was able to do it out here, right? And that's what entrepreneurs do, right? Entrepreneurs solve big problems, they create new value because they have this vision for what they want to create in their mind, and then it becomes external, right? Inside, out process. Be, do, have, share. So you have to be that before you be able to do it to be able to have it. Now here's what I found interesting. I didn't find it interesting that he broke the four minute mile by visualizing. What I found interesting is what happened after that. Throughout human history, nobody can run a mile in less than four minutes. One person does it, what happens after that? Yeah, everyone starts running a four minute mile. Dozens of people start doing it in the next couple years. Now let me ask you a question. Was there big advancements in shoe technology and nutritional support and training methodology? No, what was the change? A change in belief. Because you know what the belief was back then? The belief was the human heart couldn't sustain a sub four minute mile. So it would explode in your chest. Now, if you believe that, would that keep you from running a, form, a sub four minute mile? Like that would keep me from jogging, right? Nobody would do anything because if it, like no one would do anything because all behavior is belief driven, right? Then all of a sudden one person does it, then everybody starts to do it, right? And that's the power of a belief. I'm thinking about, okay, where are they and when are they doing these things? So certain people are early birds, some people are night owls. So I could teach people, like I teach people how to read one book a week. I really think leaders are readers that in order to stay competitive in today's day and age, if somebody has decades of experience and they put it into a book and you can sit down and read that in a few days, download decades into days, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir for everyone who's watching, <laughs> but that, that's, that's a superpower, right? That's a huge advantage. And so I'm thinking about, but some people, when I'm telling them to practice, and I get these real results in 30, in, you know, about four or five weeks, where it's permanent, where they can read 300% faster with the same or better comprehension. Essentially read something in 20 minutes that takes, normally takes normal people an hour. Right. But the reason why, but you have to practice. But some people will practice at inopportune times of the day and they won't get the same results. So part of it is the self-awareness, knowing your, what they call your chronotype, when's the optimal time to do this? They, they, for, depending on your body type, there's certain times of the day it's better to work out. There's better times of the day to be able to make love. There are better times of the day to be able to read, to check email, to ask for a raise. So I would think about like if I, geniuses found, find their element, their sweet spot, and they set up their routines and their rituals throughout the day to be able to align with their time when they're most productive. Right? If they're not, if they don't have a lot of energy in the morning, working out is probably not as good as doing it some other time. Um, so the when and the where and setting up your environment for success because all your triggers are there that allow them. So I think geniuses set themselves up. So for example, they have their laptop, but they only use their laptop for work and it's anchored, that's part of their environment, it's anchored to get them into flow states to be able to write or be productive. They don't use their laptop to watch binge on Netflix 
right? They have a very, they have an iPad that they use when they do that because that's the state that they want to anchor for that. And they don't use that iPad to do work. You know, setting up your environment like your bedroom. Like we just did a whole episode on sleep hacks and how to optimize your sleep because that's a big, you know, personal challenge for me um, for many years because I had suffered from sleep apnea. You know, it's a breathing disorder. I stopped breathing 200 times a night for at least 10 seconds, which is the equivalent of somebody coming in and choking and suffocating you 200 times a night. That's and so crazy. I would actually, the reason why I'm so adamant about productivity and learning hacks is because for the longest time, for literally five years straight, and you know this, I've slept about 90 minutes to two hours a night total. Oof. And you know how you feel when you get like one bad night of sl yes. sleep and how like where your focus is, your energy level, and your, how I get these horrible migraines. And it's forced me to double down in my practices you know, in terms of like, I have a limited amount of time. I have to focus on the things that really matter, resources and stuff. But anyway, going back to this, like my bedroom is sacred space, right? It's, I don't do work in there. I, I keep it because that's my trigger to be able to rest, go into parasympathetic right. space. I set up my environment so I have my blackout curtains, I have my grounding pad, so it's to optimize my restful sleep that I do get. So environment, so genius leaves clues, they set up genius environments for themselves. And then the behaviors, most people know because they're intuitive. You know, these people are, are, are investing in themselves, they're, they're investing in self-care. Um, I always tell people that self-love and self-care is not selfish. A lot of people, you know, they're there for their friends and their family and their clients and everybody else, but they're not refilling their, their cup. So I think that we have to be, you know, grow givers, meaning we have to we grow so we have more to give to other people, so we have more impact with other individuals. So the behaviors are reading each day and putting together your to-do list and your, I think having your not to-do list is so important. Having been sleep deprived for so many years, you know, I think a lot of people I'm super sensitized to it, but I think one of the success rituals people ha should have is just going through and keeping a consistent not to-do list. And I think the most successful genius level individuals, one of the clues that they leave is their not to-do list is bigger than their to-do list, right? They don't check their phone in the morning. They don't take in, you know, everything is hell yes or it's hell no, right? That's their filter system. They don't, you know, they say no to good, so they can say yes, yes to great. Mm -hmm. Um, so the behaviors, then you have the, the habits, which, and then you have the, the beliefs and the values and beliefs and the values, you know, because I, I watch, this is one of the reasons why I, wa I watch your show, because I'm just hearing all the time you're listening to these amazing beliefs about from achievers in all, every area. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you have Wyclef there and you know, and like Mel and you have all these amazing individuals, but you see that there's a pattern that's there, mm. right? And there's an art and but there's a science to it there and there's an art to it and how they express themselves. And then I also do believe that some of those successful geniuses, and I say genius is not just, I'm not talking about IQ, right? I'm talking about an incredible you know, artist. I'm talking about an athlete. I'm talking about an advocate you know, in some area. Um, is they haven't, they're, they're clear about their identity, about who they are and who they are to the, to the world. And so, but I know what they, what they do commit is they do the work and they're committed to lifelong learning. And I feel like that learning, I always tell people, and we've had this, we had this conversation that if knowledge is power, then learning is your superpower. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a superpower that we all have. It's just that we're not taught. Like recently we had uh, Quincy Jones in our audience and I had to pull him on stage, right? And I was just like, you know, I was like, I have to ask you, you know, we are the world and Michael Jackson and Oprah, like, you know, what did you, how'd you overcome these challenges that, you know, these problems that you had to be able to create this, you know, this legacy. And he looked at me, he's like, Jim, he's like, I don't have any problems. I'm like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, you're 84, you have no problems. And she's like, no, I have puzzles. And I was like, wow, like that little shift of vocabulary changed everything for me. Yeah, because puzzles are like riddles. They could, you could, you could solve, you could solve them, right? There's answers for it. And it was a change of perspective.